some writing at bishopstrickland.com, letters to priests, a letter to bishops, a letter to the baptized. We'll ask them about all of it as we come down the stretch of Holy Week in preparation for the Holy Triduum and the great feast of Easter. We'll also open the phone lines and take your calls and questions for Bishop Strickland today on The Simple Truth. We consecrate everything here to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the pure, strong heart of St. Joseph. Bishop Strickland, welcome back to The Simple Truth. Thank you for being with us today. How are you and will you lead us in an opening prayer? Good, Jim. Uh, glad to. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for these high holy days of our Catholic faith, a time for us to be reminded of the very heart of our life in Jesus Christ, his passion, death, and resurrection, which we celebrate beginning with poem or Passion Sunday and then continuing all the way through Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and then, of course, Easter Sunday. Lord, we pray that we may enter more fervently than ever into these holy days and be aware of the wondrous sacrifice of love that your Son has offered for all of us, for all humanity. Guide us in the witness of the saints and especially the intercession of the Immaculate Virgin Mary. And we ask this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you very much, Bishop <coughs> Joseph Strickland. We'll open the phone lines now. Any calls or questions, we'll keep it open throughout the show. If you've got anything that you want to call about, one 877 that's one 877 uh, But what I'm very interested uh, to hear about, Bishop, is um, the writings that you've been doing over at bishopstrickland.com. So um, I'm really focusing on starting with the letter to priests back in December 21st. There were a couple others after that, and then the letter to bishops and the letter to the baptized uh, more recently. Um, but these letters to priests, what was what was the prompting there? What was the good prompting that kind of sparked um, that you wanted to write to your brother priests? Well, thanks, Jim. Um, interestingly, as often happens uh, when we seek to follow the Lord, uh, he brings good out of darkness, light, and hope out of uh, sometimes, I, I wouldn't say despair, but uh, deep concern, I would uh, say that. Actually, what prompted um, writing the letter, the original letter to priest, and basically continued in the same spirit. Um, what prompted that was me rereading a document called Demos. Um, it was published anonymously uh, back in the months before Cardinal uh, Pell died, and then after his death, it was attributed to him as that he was the, the cardinal who was the uh, anonymous author of Demos. Um, since then, since my letter even, um, another document, Demos II, has been published by once again an anonymous um, cardinal. Um, but rereading Demos, uh, now Demos I, I guess, the Demos document, it basically just described the, the, the serious state of corruption in the life of the church, both moral corruption and uh, financial corruption, really corruption of all kinds. And honestly, Jim, I was uh, deflated and deeply concerned after reading that document. And in prayer and, and thinking about that and reflecting and and trying to be what I believe we're called to be, and certainly this Holy Week reminds us that we're always people of hope, even in the midst of darkness and deep concern. And so I felt prompted uh, to really talk to the priests uh, of the world, more or less, as I said in the document or the letter, I, I really have no credentials except that I believe deeply in Jesus Christ in his church. I know that she will prevail in the midst of all of this. But it, it just occurred to me, what's the answer? What's the answer to all of this? 
And a big part of the answer, I truly believe, and I believe as firmly as I did when I published that original letter, is holy priests. And what I talk about in that original letter is a call for priests to be deeply Marian and deeply Eucharistic. And that is tied to the vision of St. John Bosco, a beautiful saint of approximately three or 400 years ago. Um, St. John Bosco had a vision of the church in the, the image of a ship in a terrible storm. Uh, the, the ship of the church looked like it's going to be ripped apart or just dashed to pieces on the rocks. Uh, so the the ship of the church and, and the church the image of the church the bark of Peter is an ancient image of the church some of the earliest art it depicts the church as a ship and so this vision of Saint John Bosco as the church is a ship in a terrible storm and it's anchored to two pillars uh, you can find this their paintings depicting this dream or vision of Saint John Bosco. And the pillars are the Blessed Virgin Mary and our Lord in the Eucharist. And those have been pillars in my life. I would imagine they're pillars in your life and in most of our lives. I was so uh, pleased to be reminded as you introduced the the show once again um, that you do everything through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, seeking a deeper life in the Sacred Heart of Christ. And so those images are there in these two pillars as well. The Immaculate uh, Heart of Mary, the Sacred Heart of Christ, Marian devotion and Eucharistic devotion, those are the two pillars that were the anchors holding the ship of the church in uh, St. John Bosco's vision. And I truly believe in, in my own life, I can testify to the strength and the clarity and the you know, some have called it boldness, but just the knowledge that I must speak the truth. I must uh, speak of the the glorious and beautiful truth that flows from the sacred heart of Christ and that the immaculate heart of Mary is always pointing us back to. We all wander in our sinfulness. We wander in a sinful world. Humanity, even in the time that Jesus walked the earth, That was the reality. The disciples, I mean, we're just going through the dramas of Holy Week. We read the Passion Gospel on Sunday, and we will read on Good Friday another version of the Passion Gospel, Christ dying on the cross. And all of that really sets before us what the Gospel tells us. This struggle between good and evil, between darkness and light, has been the everlasting struggle of the church. It's meant to be. Uh, We have to trust that the church will prevail, but each of us individually, each member of the baptized mystical body of Christ is called to do our very best to seek holiness. And I guess I was inspired to remind the priest that they are the ones that have to lead the flock. Uh, Jim, I think you would agree. I think most people listening would agree that really the day-to-day living out of our Catholic faith happens in our homes and in our parishes for the most part. I mean, that's the day-to-day life of Catholics. And so if our home is deeply Catholic with good home piety and um, sacramentals that remind us and assist us, praying the rosary, praying the stations, all of those things can help us to have a more faith-filled Catholic home. And those homes then then come together in the parish home where the church, the priest is the father guiding the all of these c- homes that come together in community. And so I guess I was really prompted to say, let's not despair, let's not see things as hopeless, but let's go back to the basics. And it's got to start with the parish priest. Certainly there's some wonderful priests that are not working in parishes that are religious orders and various other ministries But I think we'd all agree that the the core of the church and the basic foundation is parish life. And so the stronger and holier the priests are, the stronger and holier the people are going to be. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're very blessed to have Bishop Joseph Strickland with us. Phone lines are open. Any question you might have, any call, one eight one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. That's one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. That uh, vision of St. John Bosco, so powerful, so uh, simple, so helpful, as is the proclamation of Bishop Strickland for us here. And yeah, as you break open um, these letters um, written by Bishop Strickland, again, bishopstrickland.com, if you want to read them for yourself, he does encourage priests uh, to be Marian priests. He encourages them to, um, to be Eucharistic priests. And he says this in one letter. He says, Our challenge as priests of the 21st century demands that we seek holiness, real holiness. Although simplistic, I recommend striving to know Jesus Christ and his sacred heart more intimately. I am reminded of the 11 faithful apostles in contrast to the unfaithful one, Judas Iscariot. He says, the few times Judas is mentioned, it seems clear that he is preoccupied with the purse and not with learning at the feet of the master. Goes on to say, as his 21st century priest, we are called to continually deepen our relationship with him, with Jesus. And as with any relationship, it will require effort and selflessly spending quality time in his presence in Eucharistic adoration. Um, Words that need to be heard words that need to be faithfully lived out. And um, yeah, we want to pray for all of our priests out there, especially our pastors of, of parishes. And these this, this fulfillment of the office of the priesthood of our pastors, this is what we want to see. These are the shepherds we want to follow. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. This is Jesuit Father Robert McTagg, your daily host of The Catholic Current. Join me on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern to welcome back a listener favorite, author and critic Sarah Kane, better known as the Crusader Gal, will be talking about when medicine mandates murder. How is this possible? Hear it all in The Catholic Current on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, coming to you from the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network presents Saints and Seasons. On March 26th, we celebrate the feast of St. Luger, Bishop and Confessor. Luger was born to a wealthy noble Frisian couple in the early 740s. As a young man, he encountered St. Boniface, the apostle to the Germans, and was greatly inspired by Boniface's martyrdom. Luger studied under Boniface's disciple, St. Gregory of Utrecht, then traveled to England to be ordained a deacon and to continue his education under Blessed Alcuin of York, with whom Luger maintained a lifelong friendship. Luger was ordained a priest back on the continent, and he preached throughout Frisia until a pagan uprising led by the Saxons forced him to leave. He spent several years with the Benedictines at Monte Cassino, though he took no vows. After the Emperor Blessed Charlemagne conquered the Saxons, Luger returned to Frisia and resumed his missionary work, with such success that Charlemagne appointed him missionary to Saxony. With the help of his younger brother, St. Hildegrim, and sister, St. Gerburgis, Luger founded many churches and monasteries, and was finally reluctantly consecrated as Bishop of Münster. The Apostle of Saxony died on March 26th in the year of our Lord, 809. Also celebrated on this day are St. Castellus of Rome, St. Braulio, a close friend of St. Isidore of Seville, and many other martyrs, confessors, and holy virgins. For more about the saints and seasons of the Catholic Church, visit thestationofthecross.com forward slash saints and seasons. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with our guest today, Bishop Joseph Strickland. Phone lines are open. Any call question that you have for Bishop Strickland today, 1-877-511-5483. That's 1-877-511-5483. Sticking with um, one of these letters to priests that... um, that Bishop Strickland wrote again, bishopstrickland.com, to read them in their fullness, um, is is this bit. Ultimately, we must be men of self-sacrifice to become truly Eucharistic priests. We must be men of real day-to-day draining and exhausting sacrifice. We must be willing to confront false messages, no matter their origin, whether from the secular world or the church. Most importantly, we must be willing to place our lives on his altar and to join him Jesus in in the most profound sacrifice of love the world has ever known. Uh, Bishop Strickland, um, just want to say it's so refreshing to, to read these words, to hear these words. I know for many 
lay people who have been um, hurt, wounded um, by various corruption, abuses, um, by pastors, priests within their parish, in, in many various ways, including liturgical abuses. In all of these ways, um, hearing this from you, one of our shepherds, one of our bishops, um, I think it's healing. I think it's healing for many people to hear hear these words and to um, and to be affirmed in what we know to be true, that yes, this is the dignity of the office of the priesthood. And we need to hold it up in all of its glory. And we need to call men on in the priesthood to be those men that they're called to be in fulfilling those sacred offices by God's grace and for God's glory. And it's one thing for a lay person to try to do it, but for a, a bishop uh, to do it is um, is so powerful and just um, so wonderful. So thank you for doing it. Anything else that you want to share on this? Um, well, thanks, Jim. I, I guess I could talk all afternoon about it, but uh, it really, I'm glad to, to hear your reaction because that's certainly what I believe. And as I wrote the letters, certainly they're written to priests, but we are all a priestly people. You're a husband and father, a man of, of the Catholic faith, and you are called to a certain level of priestly office. Um, that is in no way uh, to discount the significance of the sacramental holy orders that a priest is ordained into. We need desperately holy priests. Um, but I think that as clearly you read it and saw inspiration for your priestly role, you might say priestly with a, a, a lowercase p rather than the sacramental priesthood, um, but both have to be complementary to each other. And the stronger, I, I'm sure you would say, Jim, and most men who are striving to truly be the, the Catholic men leading, along with the, the great support and complementarity of their spouses, their wives, uh, but men do have a leadership role that is absolutely necessary. To me, I mean, I know I'm sort of reading off your sheet music because your, your work to have men's marches for the, the sanctity of life and to call men forward, clearly you, you support this and you know the importance of it. So as anyone reads, men or women, priest or laity, as we read these letters, I hope they do inspire us to remember what the Mass is about, what the role of a priest is, and really, by extension, what the role of every person participating in that Eucharistic liturgy. For, since Vatican II, we've heard uh, full and active participation in the Mass. And I think we, honestly, and I, I would hold myself accountable for getting that wrong. I think we interpreted that in the earlier years, and even still, there's too much interpretation of full and active participation in the Mass as, well, everybody's got to have a role, and everybody's, you know, you're kind of running around busy, and you're, you're doing things. I don't think that's what the Council meant, and I believe absolutely full and active participation means going deeply into what is happening at that altar. Bread and wine become the body and blood, soul and divinity of the same Jesus Christ that we are celebrating during this Holy Week with his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and then his being laid in the tomb and rising from the dead. All of that is captured at every Mass. And I think the more we can engage in that and participate in our own place, not usurping someone else's place, but Everyone has a place around the altar and at the altar to celebrate and live and be in wonder of Jesus Christ, who is really with us, especially in the Eucharist. So as I wrote those words, um, I would imagine you would agree that I, I never felt like I've adequately expressed in words what I'm trying to say in a homily or in a written letter or in any way. It, you, you strive to say something that is a, a bit intangible, but I was trying to remind myself and every priest of the wondrously glorious call 
that being a priest is and our greatest work with all the things that a priest can do, the greatest work is at the Eucharistic altar. And really all the sacramental life is a close second to that and flows out of the Eucharistic altar. The sacrament of confession, anointing of the sick, celebrating marriages, baptizing, all of those flow from Christ himself who is there on the altar. So honestly, I think we as priests need to be fired up about what we do, the wondrous call. I could never be worthy. And I've probably mentioned to you before, um, Domine non sum dignus is one of my favorite phrases in the Mass. And I pray it often throughout the Mass because it's absolutely true. Lord, I am not worthy. None of us are. But Christ has gone through everything that we're celebrating this Holy Week in order to supply that worthiness that is always and will always be lacking for us as human beings, as men and women. But that's part of the glory of following Jesus Christ is he has supplied the worthiness. He's made it possible for me as a sinful man who is called to overcome sin over and over again, but for me to stand at, a, at an altar and take bread and wine and say his words, and it becomes him, his body and blood, soul, and divinity. There's no greater work being done in the world and no more necessary work. And honestly, in my formation as a priest, um, we were encouraged to pray, but maybe I just wasn't smart enough to pick up on it. But I think that as we see where the church is, I don't think that this was emphasized enough. I know it wasn't emphasized enough for me. And there are many things that a priest is involved in, but always it needs to go back to the Eucharistic altar. And I would encourage younger priests and seminarians that are um, in formation, really every priest, but especially those just getting started, to avoid some of the, the temptations out there that I fell into, honestly, of worrying more about getting the bills paid and, and getting the parking lot paved and all the, the worldly things that need to be taken care of. But I think the skills of priests need to be developed to, to be good delegators and to call those who are talented in all the various areas, just like in your home, home Jim. I mean, I'm sure you can't take care of every single need that pops up in your home. <laughs> You have to have collaborators. You have to have people assisting. I think that priests need to remember that as well and look for those collaborators, never losing focus on the primary work of the priest. As for you as a father and husband, your primary work is to that relationship with your wife and to nurture the lives of your children. And everything else is really in support of that. I can imagine that for you, and for many men out there working in the world, working hard, doing their best, it's easy to get that out of focus. And, and I'm sure we've both known men in our lives, and maybe you've struggled with balancing and not getting so caught up in the work to earn the money to do the things you need to do to support the home that you forget your primary job. I think that's what I was trying to say to priests is, Remember your primary job and don't let the, the really peripheral things that need to be done and are important, but they're less important than standing at the altar and bringing to the, the Lord to God's people at every Mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really well said. And, uh, you know, yeah, if we're going to have this renewal of holiness, um, and, and this is in each one of us, um, then, then yes, we have to understand um, rightly what our roles are, what our vocation is, the sacred offices, uh, the sacred office of our vocation that we're called to fulfill. We need to see that it, there's a lofty dignity to it, to, to be a, a priest of Jesus Christ, to be a bishop, 
the fullness of holy orders, to be a husband and a father. Um, these are these are big deals. These are big offices that we have no chance at even coming close to fulfilling these offices faithfully without God's grace, which leads us right back to the need for him. It ought to lead us right back to his feet and just wanting to be with him, to be filled with his grace, with his love, so that we actually can be faithful in fulfilling this office. I think of uh, just in uh, reading some of the gospel today um, in the morning prayer with the family and, uh, and and thinking about that part where Peter is um, is just so ready uh, to to go unto death with Jesus, and uh, and Jesus is telling him, "No, you're gonna, you're you're not going to." And and Peter persists, and instead of humbling himself and asking, "Will you help me, Jesus? Will you help me?" If he would have asked him to, for his help, I wonder how that would have played out. I think Jesus would have helped him, and he wouldn't have been falling asleep at Gethsemane and and so forth. But we do have the beautiful redemption um, in, in their encounter after the resurrection. Um, but just to say, look, it's it's easy to people if we can if we point fingers at one another that's not helpful if the lay people are pointing to the priests and the priests are pointing to the lay people so on and so forth and we're saying why aren't you doing better look we all have to fulfill the role fulfill our vocations um, by God's grace so that is we're, we all have that in common and so we ought to be encouraging one another in that and it all comes back to prayer and I think there is an order to this renewal though that um, look if the fathers were renewed I have a sense that there would this renewal would catch fire really fast amongst uh, the women and, and them fulfilling their roles with greater fidelity if the fathers really stepped up and um, and, and took responsibility for really fulfilling theirs to the full. If they stepped into that leadership, I think we'd see a lot of good fruits really quick. But all that we can really control is each one of us has to strive to participate with God's grace and make that commitment for our own lives. But we can band together in some brotherhood. And I do appreciate you, Bishop Strickland, coming out to uh, our last event in Temecula, California, the National Men's March to Abolish Abortion Rally for Personhood. It was a great blessing to have you with us. There's a great video uh, summary on the events, which uh, which really began in prayer and ended in prayer with Eucharistic holy hours and masses uh, led by Bishop Strickland. Certainly always have the help of uh, Father Stephen Imbarato with us as well. We are very blessed in these events. We want you to become a part of them as well. If you want to join us for the next one or learn more, go to themensmarch.com, themensmarch.com. But also in a letter that Bishop Strickland wrote, he commented on the Roe v. Wade anniversary. We'll get to that when we get back, as well as his letter to his brother bishops and and uh, have him speak to that a little bit. But also want to take your calls. Any question that you have, one 511 5483 We'll be right back. This is Life News Radio. I'm Jim Anderson. Over 250 mothers and children were spared abortion in the latest 40 Days for Life campaign of prayer and pro-life witness. Organizers say an online event next month will offer details and tell new developments coming to the 40 Days effort. Lozier Institute statistician Dr. Michael New is again shining what must be an uncomfortable light on abortion industry stats. Maybe you have heard among legacy media that Dobbs did not work and recent chemical abortions offset other abortion declines. It shouldn't take a doctor to figure this out. Yet, Dr. New says the stats supporting such claims came from abortion pill providers, reliably biased advocates. It's like asking foxes about recent hen house raids. The bad news for everyone involved is that if abortion pill use did not spike as much as abortion groups claim, the spike in ER visits make the pills even more statistically dangerous. The tragic stories placed in Supreme Court record by chemical abortion users tell of shock, sorrow, and substantial injury. This is Life News Radio. We must have an end to abortion and an end to the toxic watershed of ideas behind its causes. We hope you pray for an end to abortion daily. If the problem were simple, we could have a simple answer. But abortion is rooted in a long, tangled web of lies about human life and the dignity of the human person. Pray daily for a culture of life. 
The Supreme Court hearing Tuesday over rolling back FDA abortion pill allowances is just the beginning of the work by justices. It is also just the beginning of ongoing prayer. Catholic bishops and other pro-life leaders are urging ongoing prayer for the high court's deliberations. For pro-life headlines delivered to your email address daily, sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Bishop Joseph Strickland. Phone lines are open if you have any question or comment for Bishop Strickland today. 1-877-511-5483. That's 1-877-511-5483. In this final letter to priests addressed on, um, well, the weekend of uh, the Roe v. Wade anniversary um, back in January. So, You write that um, we must never cease speaking against this diabolical decision while constantly proclaiming the sanctity of life. Um, You go on to unpack that throughout, and it did catch my attention as you really stand up for um, for this being the preeminent issue of our time, which strikes me because that has been sort of a a point of conflict, it seems, over the the recent years um, at the USCCB meetings. uh, We've reported on it where you would stand up vocally um, and and speak to your brother bishops on this very humbly, um, but very clearly and very firmly. This is the preeminent issue of our time. And um, and that's what it is. And and it's sad that there's this conflict and, and bishops are trying to, um, I guess, minimize what's going on there and, and make it something else that is more important or whatever. We've seen some of these arguments, they fall flat uh, very quickly. Um, but thank you for being for being a champion of the truth and for um, our littlest brothers and sisters who are being mass murdered today and every day in our nation by the thousands and around the world by the hundreds of thousands every day. Um, Anything else you want to share on this, um, this final letter to priests on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade? Well, thanks, Jim. Um, I guess I'd have to say, obviously I've always believed that uh, abortion, the, the killing of unborn infants in the womb is the most devastating and truly the preeminent issue. And frankly, as we see more and more issues of of life, more and more attacks on life at all different levels, from all different angles, from pornography to the, the border issues where people are saying, oh, we'll have no borders and everything will be fine. And that is is contrary to what God has revealed to us. It's not respecting the individual or the individual nation. So, I mean, it's it's a long list that I see of, you know, child trafficking or human trafficking of whatever age, uh, euthanasia, all the basic issues that are ripping apart our nation, our world, and even affecting the church because we're we're waffling on some of these issues. Um, I truly believe more than ever, unless we can get on the same page that slaughtering unborn children is devastating at all for all aspects of the sanctity of life, unless we can truly embrace that, you know, we've got huge problems ahead and more and more. Uh, denial of the sanctity of lives of of children, of teenagers, of men, of women, of different races. All of it flows out, I believe, out of that horrible, um, you know, font, if you can call it that. It's more like a cesspool of of what abortion does to the psyche, to the society. Um, it really must be addressed and. You know, we make progress, and thankfully the Roe v. Wade decision has been reversed. But I guess what I tried to say in that letter is we can't relax in any way because there are too many people, and we have leaders in the nation that are vehemently and adamantly saying, we want to push for a right to slaughter unborn children that is written into the very fabric of our nation. That is a devastating push that 
people are, are, I mean, as this election year progresses, I'm afraid we're going to see more and more of that. And so I just see that the, the abortion as a preeminent issue for our time just becomes more and more clear and we've got to embrace, for those of us who know that life is sacred, God is the author of life. It's not up to us. And when we, the more we pretend that it is, the more the sanctity of life is attacked and the more the life that God has given us unravels. So I believe we must be, and I know people are very tired of hearing from me, but they're going to just have to put up with it because I feel obligated because too many aren't listening. I know that you share my uh, vigorous voice of we've got to speak up for this. Men do, women do, everyone. Um, and, and thankfully, many are, but there are too many that are in places of power that are not. And we've got to it ultimately always comes down to a conversion of hearts. Converted hearts will change the laws and will protect unborn children and all the sanctity of life issues more profoundly. Uh, so we've got to work to the conversion of hearts. And then the changes that need to happen will begin to fall into place. Yes, yeah. Bishop Joseph Strickland is with us. If you have a call for him today, any question, any comment, one 877 That's one 877 And the next National Men's March to uh, Abolish Abortion Rally for Personhood, that's actually going to be on the weekend of the Dobbs anniversary in June. So the Dobbs anniversary on June 24th, but it's going to be the Saturday right before that. So June 22nd in Rochester, New York, ho home of uh, the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass, um, a, a place of uh, abolition there in Rochester, New York. And so we're coming to um, to stand for the least of these and to and to get the ball rolling the best that we can for an abolitionist movement to end this daily mass murder of um of our littlest brothers and sisters and to uh and to get people together to call all pro-life people of goodwill to come together on this this ought to be a place where we can um build great unity with one another regardless of any other differences can we stand up for the least of these together so again rochester new york uh, january 22nd saturday january 22nd the men's march .com. Uh, we'll have all the information up there, and uh, please come and join us if, if at all possible. Save that date, uh, June 22nd. And it also happens to be the Saturday after Father's Day, uh, an, another piece that's important. And, and women have a role in this. We want them to be there with us at the initial gathering, even this time. We're plugging in with the, the event every fourth Saturday there in Rochester, the Stand Together for Life. So men and women standing together outside of the headquarters of Planned Parenthood of, of West Central and Western New York. And then the men will do their march to the rally point and the women will come back together with us there and we'll have some more national and local speakers. It's going to be a great day. Again, Rochester, New York, June 22nd, themensmarch.com. All right, Bishop Strickland, you also wrote on February 29th a letter to bishops, a letter to your brother bishops, um, and you started by saying, my dear brother bishops, I am, com I am compelled to speak to all of my brother bishops around the world, including Pope Francis, Bishop of Rome. In many ways, I am the least among you, but I share with you the anointing as a successor of the apostles and the call to guard the deposit of faith. And I speak to you in this spirit. So you uh, you, you felt this this sense to speak to the priests and then this, this compelling uh, good prompting to speak to your brother bishops. Tell us more about that, Bishop Strickland. Well, I guess what prompted that letter um, after the, the letters to the priests was just the, the tremendous confusion and contradictions that we're hearing in the church. Um, and bishops are, you know, we're the, the successors of the apostles. I specifically um, mentioned Pope Francis out of respect for really his primary office is Bishop of Rome. That's a, a glorious um, office first held by St. Peter, the first pope. And we, you know, there's a lot that has been built around the papacy and 
Even the, the name Pope uh, develops later. But to be a, a successor of the apostles, a bishop of the sea city of Rome for the universal church, that is a tremendous gift and a tremendous responsibility. That's why I always encourage people to, to continue to pray for Pope Francis. Whatever your concerns, whatever your issues, to pray for this man who sits in the chair of St. Peter, to pray for him, as we said earlier, to be drawn more deeply into the sacred heart of Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And then to, and, and as I, I tried to recognize, I, I mean, even as I was composing the letter, it occurred to me, it's like, what right, what position do I have to be writing a letter to all the bishops of the world? Um, and really, I don't have any credentials, except I'm a bishop. And I was anointed, as all bishops are, to live the promises that we made. And going back to the language we were using a minute ago, I would say that guarding the deposit of faith is the preeminent promise that bishops have made in their ordination. Every bishop ordained makes that promise. And I think it's critical that we really live up to that promise, guarding the deposit of faith. I know that many disagree, and many will say, oh, it, it, it's very similar, really, Jim, I think to, in a philosophical way, it's similar to the situation with the, the, the life of the unborn and how that's a preeminent issue. If we're not guarding the deposit of faith, then where is the church? What, what are we about? The deposit of faith is, is believing that bread and wine become not just a symbol, but the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. That's one element of a multitude of truths that have been revealed to us that make up the deposit of faith. I've had many people ask me, what is the deposit of faith? As if it was, you know, some list of, of teachings that the church has. It's everything that the church is about. I love to say, as I speak of the, the Word of God, Jesus Christ is the Word incarnate. And, and that's a very common understanding theologically. He is the incarnate Word. We even have institutions in the church named incarnate Word. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the incarnation of the deposit of faith. He's the incarnation of everything we believe everything that we're called to be about, because He is the sinless Son of God who walked among us. All the sacraments flow out of Him. All the teachings of who we are as human beings are exemplified in the perfect man who walked this earth, the sinless one who was also not just man, but fully God, and certainly always complementary to Christ in the great plan of God is his mother, the woman protected not by her power. Christ is sinless under his own power as God's eternal son. The Blessed Virgin Mary is protected from her conception, protected from sin, and thus she is the womanly model for all of us men and women, as Christ is the manly model for all men and women. Uh, he is divine, Mary's not, but by God's grace, we have the, the queen of heaven and earth, and we have the king of the universe to inspire us, to challenge us, to guide us. And, and I think we need to think of the deposit of faith as a living person, not as, as a few documents that can be changed if we decide to change them. No, no more than we can change who Jesus Christ is the very fabric of his existence, we can't change his truth. And we're hearing a lot of, a lot of people speak as if we can change that truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this line from the letter uh, to bishops from Bishop Strickland. He says, uh, resist any temptation to share only the portion of his truth, Jesus's truth, that the world accepts in order to avoid the ire of a world that still hates him. 
right? So to it's a temptation to share only the portion of the truth, of Jesus' truth that the world accepts, um, and then avoid the ire of the world that still hates him by not proclaiming the truth in the areas that are unpopular. We, we need to proclaim the truth in the area that is unpopular. And the fact is, is that Jesus, even there, the truth is for us. It is love. It is goodness. It is beautiful. We're going to be right back. Stay tuned. Can we be happy without God? Atheists say yes. We Christians say yes, but only to a certain extent. What's our reason? There are some natural human desires that can be satisfied without living for God. The desire for sensory pleasure, success, and loving relationships. There are certain desires, however, that can't be satisfied without God. For example, we don't just desire some love, we desire infinite love, love without limit. This is manifest when we get frustrated with imperfect manifestations of it. The same is true for knowledge, justice, and beauty. Since God alone is infinite in these perfections, only He can satisfy our desires for them. Therefore, to borrow from St. Augustine, without God, our hearts would be forever restless. And my friends, a restless heart is an unhappy heart. I'm Carlo Broussard with a ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. Please join us in a prayer to St. Anthony of Padua. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh, dear protector, St. Anthony, on this day we direct our fervent prayer to you, asking you to hear us and to intercede for us. We are parents who ask for peace in our families, our worthy occupations, and our daily bread. We are children who ask for divine assistance and protection in the hope of a successful and happy future. We are the needy poor, the afflicted, and sinners who come to you for help and grace. Therefore, speak on our behalf to that child whom you hold in your arms, and we are sure of being heard. Amen. here with our guest today, Bishop Joseph Strickland. Final segment here, last chance to get your phone call in. Any question, comment that you have for Bishop Strickland today, 1-877-511-5483. That's 1-877-511-5483. And uh, Bishop Strickland, I want to just bring it right back to that letter to bishops and, and to that line I was mentioning right before the break. Specifically, resist any temptation uh, to share only the portion of his truth that the world accepts in order to avoid the ire of a world that still hates him. Uh, very appropriate um, as we're on in Tuesday of Holy Week here. Um, the same things that played out in that first Holy Week are still playing out here every day, choosing uh, Barabbas and uh, and calling out crucify uh, Jesus. Um, we, we, we still see these same uh, these same evils, the same deception of the evil one. Um, this is Jesus who has come in his love for us. The fullness of the truth in all these areas and these areas that are unpopular where people hate him because he proclaims a truth they do not want to hear, we still need to proclaim the truth there even more so and try to help people to understand that this is for them. We, what we can't do, though, is just say, well, we're not, we're, we'll just not talk about that anymore. Or we'll just try to change the teaching or pretend that that's not part of it anymore or something like that. Um, but we do see, um, we do see this in, in the church and certainly outside of the church as well. But Bishop, anything that you can share on this? I mean, as a bishop, um, you, you write about this probably as one who has experienced this temptation in some way at some point how did you um how did you reject this temptation how did you overcome it well really jim um i have to honestly answer that question by going back to the very beginning of our conversation this afternoon um the two pillars mary and the eucharist um and I've certainly got a long way to go to, to grow closer to that wondrous truth that is in uh, devotion to Mary, who is always going to point us 
more to her son, to his Eucharistic face, to every aspect of her son. But it's through that that I've had the strength to really oppose, I would say, fairly uh, strong forces uh, telling me to quit speaking these things that people don't want to hear. Quit speaking in the way that I have, trying to be clear. I've always tried to do so with humility um, and with understanding that I'm nobody. I really am nobody. But I couldn't be quiet. And I'd have to say, <laughs> if you want to blame somebody, blame Mary and blame the, our Lord in the Eucharist. Hanging out with them can get you in hot water. Um, but that there, that's where the strength comes from. And I have to say, um, G, even as we're talking about this, Jim, in prayer this morning, and I, I, I need prayer. And, you know, I don't want in any way to give the impression, oh, this is some super holy guy. He prays all the time. I need to pray all the time. And I don't pray enough. But prayer, I've, I've been blessed with beautiful experiences in my prayer. And this morning was one of those um, where I was reflecting. I mean, it's Tuesday. I typically pray the, the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary. I was in Eucharistic adoration. And it just I, I just sort of got caught up in uh, reflecting on the betrayal of Christ. And it, it really ties into exactly what you've highlighted in that letter. Because as you said, Jim, the, what we're going through this Holy Week is being played out in our time. It was played out a generation ago. It's been played out in the world ever since Christ, ever since that original Holy Week. Uh, there have been many holy people, but there have been many betrayals as well. And it was uh, just a very beautiful and fruitful reflection that I actually want to return to because I'm sure you've had the experience when you get caught up in something like that. It's just so multidimensional and so blessed to to reflect on this truth. I mean, I've thought about the agony in the garden, the scourging at the pillar, the crowning with the crown of thorns many, many times. But what occurred to me during this Holy Week is there, there are multiple characters and multiple moments of betrayal in those moments of Christ's life. I mean, certainly we think of Judas Iscariot. He was the principal betrayer, you could say. But in a sense, and I think that Peter and the other apostles would humbly agree that there was some element of betrayal in them, not as intentional certainly as Judas, but they weren't there, like you said, standing uh, stalwart strength and standing with Christ um, you know, it might have been a very different story if they had. And Christ certainly makes it clear that it's not their time to be crucified with him. I mean, he, he, did, he makes it very clear that it wasn't his intention that they have, a, you know, 11 crosses along with his and all of them ending up crucified all at the same time. That's not what happened. That was not God's plan. But... I think the betrayals that we see, some aspects of it, I mean, I think Peter would say his denial was at least moments of betrayal. Thankfully, he had time to repent, as thankfully we do as well when we, when we tr uh, sin. And that, that's ultimately this contem contemplation of betrayal. Uh, it, it, it makes me realize all of my sins or small betrayals. So we can't hold at arm's length and say, oh, those people are saying crucify him. We have to enter painfully into that and acknowledge, I've said that myself. I've said, we want Barabbas. What a betrayal. But the world is still saying in so many ways, we want Barabbas. We don't want Christ. We want Barabbas. Mm -hmm. And how betrayed is Christ in our time? Not to wallow in that, but to Hopefully, if we go through this Holy Week with that kind of passion and love for the Lord, his resurrection is that much more wondrous and powerful. I think of the betrayal of Pilate, the betrayal of um, the Jewish leadership, Caiaphas, the betrayal of 
the people standing by, the betrayal that kept happening. And in it, part of my reflection this morning was Christ himself, as I'm sitting there in his presence, looking at his Eucharistic face and, and imagining him hearing as a man. Yes, he's the son of God, but he's a real man also. And his manly, sacred heart being stabbed by those words, we don't want you, we want Barabbas, crucify him. Uh, and that, so sadly, those words echo through the ages of the church. So, and again, I think we have to be conscious of that, not to drag ourselves down, but to do the opposite, to be uplifted by the wondrous sacrificial love of the Lord, even as he hears that. A few hours later, he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That is beyond what most of us could ever come to. But as God's eternal son, suffering as a man, he's able to say those words that echo through the ages in the face of all the betrayals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... As we uh, as we meditate that beautiful meditation on the betrayal and take responsibility, yes, for our own sins and to repent and to uh, do penance and reparation and commit ourselves to greater love of our Lord to ask for his help. Ask for his help. God, help me. I, I don't want to betray you. I want to be faithful. Help me. Grant me a faithful heart. And uh, I didn't get to uh, the letter to the baptized. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that next time. I'm going to have Bishop Strickland back next month with us. Uh, we'll get to more there as well as a couple calls came in at the end. Mary in Buffalo, New York. Sorry about that. We'll get you in next time. Make sure to call. We'll try to uh, get people to call in a little bit earlier in the show la next time. But thank you, Bishop Strickland, so much for being with us. Can you close us out with a final blessing? Sure. Mighty God, we ask your blessing for Jim and all those assisting him. Help us to continue to joyfully proclaim the truth that is Jesus Christ. And we ask this blessing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. St. Thomas More House of Prayer and discover the prayer that will 